Yeah. I'm, I've just started recording because you're talking about interesting things. This is like a perfect trailer <laughs> for the episode. I was going to say, why don't we do this then? Because it, it, this story is really interesting. I can really resonate with the kind of yeah. working on what you said about working on other people's careers and forgetting that you're a creative. And, yeah. and so why don't we try to cover that journey then of, of creative yeah. nestlings from, from where it was and you going on that that two, three year okay. journey and then yeah. back to where you are now and finding it. How about that? Okay. Yeah. No, cool. So do I go introduce myself? <laughs> yeah. So um, first of all, we, we usually have a icebreaker question. Um, yeah. What does your name have any meaning or reason? Yeah. So my name is Dillion Superpiri. So Dillion is our loyalty. So it's a variation of like Dylan and Dillian and Dillon and all this, but it just means loyalty basically. Uh, and then Sipo is a, is a, is a Derele name because I'm Zimbabwean. Um, so Dillian, so, so Sipo is, is, means gift. So, uh, so my mother named my, my, me, my brother. So I'm, I'm the gift and my brother's in Gosi. He's for, 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 uh, God. So it's a gift from God, with gifts from God basically. And then Jillian is my father's name. He is Malawian. Well, he was Malawian. And I don't know why he has that name, but yeah, it's kind of, yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it all means, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you. That's a, it's, a, it's always interesting to, to hear. Yeah. There's always a, a reason or a story. Um, so, yeah, we can, we can just go directly, I think, into why don't you introduce yourself and then and, and we can go into talking about the journey yeah. okay uh, so my name is Dylan uh, Sipapiri um, I'm a creative uh, oh I'm a father first to one Dylan Nikiwe I'm a creative I'm an entrepreneur advisor coach sometimes an investor uh, but all around like a social sculptor what I'm super interested in as a individual is building infrastructure for everybody kind of how can I say, to, to, to thrive. So this is, the concept is called social sculpture, basically being able to build the environments for other people to be able to create in and thrive in and all that kind of So that's my super interest. Um, that's my official title, social sculptor. Uh, right now, I'm the founder of Creative Nestlings, uh, which is a creative network uh, foundation and a platform democratizing how creatives access each other, access opportunity, access knowledge, uh, and access education. Then I'm also the entrepreneur in residence uh, at a tech um, program that invests in black-owned startups, uh, early stage. It's called I'm In, uh, which is part of IDF Capital, which is a bigger fund, basically, that invests across Africa. Yeah, that's who I am. Mm. Um, and and how, how has this... Um how has how has your upbringing influenced your creative process into where where you've started creative nestlings? Yeah, I think my upbringing because I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a foreigner in South Africa right now. I was born in Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm half Malawi and half Zimbabwean already, so I was already a foreigner back in Zimbabwe already <laughs> because of my father and stuff. So my upbringing was very immigrant behavior basically so everything is important and always cover your back always make sure that you have the necessary skills just in case things change so my, my mom that kind of drew that into us that you got to have a degree you got to have um skill set that you can leverage no matter where you are so she always kind of drew that into us that doesn't matter where you are today physically what you should do is always upskilling yourself and constantly so that kind of brought up myself as a creative, as an entrepreneur. My mom was a very creative person. My mom was a maid for a very long time in South Africa. Um, but but she was a creative at the same time. She was running a fashion design brand at the same time being a maid uh, to some folks here in, in, in Cape Town and all that kind of stuff. So she always had that duality, but also she was always taking care of everybody else. So I, I kind of took that from her that always cover everyone's back, uh, less yours, <laughs> which is not necessarily a good idea all the time. Uh, which is something I've had to unlearn also as part of the process of, of me building creativeness is that I kind of got caught up in the cycle of building every infrastructure for everyone else. Whereas I am a creative myself and a filmmaker, particularly, I never made a single film up until 2019, but I went into the creative industry trying to make a film. I ended up building infrastructure and resources for everybody to kind of thrive. So 
yeah, that's how my brain kind of influenced uh, me building creative nestlings, basically, and, and building a career for my, or building my career uh, to some extent. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. How did uh, how did Creative Nestlings come to be then, and what is that infrastructure that you're you're building? So the infrastructure currently, well, Creative started off as, as like I said, particularly the selfish manner of me wanting to make a film. Oh, I wanted to study, I want to make films. That's that's my passion. That's my personal, uh, my my personal journey, my personal thing that I want to do is make movies. But then when I, when, I, when I got into the creative industry, I realized actually to be a black creative in Cape Town is a tricky thing, right? No one, there, there's no ecosystem. You don't know where to go. You don't even know what doors to knock, who's doing what, where are they, where are the resources, where are the opportunities, where's the knowledge even, right? And then, and as you know, creative education is very expensive and, I, and I'm a lazy person. After doing my degree, I didn't want to do another degree. <laughs> I wanted to make films. But then in, in that realization of, okay, wait, I, I can't really do, I can't make film because I don't have the resources and the, and, the, and the team and the flexibility, I kind of came up with the idea of let me be the community rather, right? Luckily, I had a good job then. I was working as a, uh, a business coordinator at Kevin Tourism. So through that, I got to meet a lot of people in the creative industry because tourism and creativity kind of go hand in hand with a lot of tourists coming from around the world, like creative tourists that would come in and paint murals and participate in exhibitions. So I, I, I would see, okay, wait, this is, all this is happening, but where are all the black people? We're in South Africa, we're in Cape Town. Where is all the people of color in this space? We found that there was no one. So that's when the kind of idea came about start documenting what's happening in the creative industry, who's doing what, what are they up to? And then, then creative business came about, the name came about the idea of, so creative is a creative quote, but then nestlings is like bird, like young birds. So we are a, a network of young African creatives, basically. That's what the kind of premise came about. And then we wanted to be the community that is that is self, um, how can I say, self-activated, self, self, self-actualized, right? So so even when, when I tried to create, kill creative nestlings in 2019, when I was like, I, I give up on this, the community wouldn't let it die. They continued on their own. We actually grew more in terms of followers and, and, and the WhatsApp group that we had created and everything during the time when I was on a break from it <laughs> because the community was socializing across the continent because clearly community is a very important tool for creative. It's lonely out there, so the community is very important. And in particular on the continent with the, with the resurgence of like, with the resurgence of like internet, and, and, and tools and monetization, there's a need for community. And the best thing to do is you go look for where the communities are and all that kind of stuff. What are they doing? How are they gathering? Um, and the internet makes it a bit easier. And also it kind of makes everything kind of localized no matter where you are. So that's, that's the cool thing about it. So that's how it came about. It started off with talk, we started off with, with a blog and then it became talks called Conversations on Creativity where we bring in creatives to share their stories and journeys right one-on-one -on -one with an audience basically so the audience would grill them for like 30 minutes an hour so how did you do this how did you do that how did you do that how did you do that that really, that really grew quite well it's spread across southern africa there has been people that have copied the talks across the entire continent even the model of creating people have copied it and, and that's okay I, I like when people copy things that we do because then they do it better in their own localized environment yeah. and then we started publishing books uh, we started doing with the annual conference. So we started really growing. The premise is always build a community. And then once the community is kind of established, and then start, building, start doing research on the community, what are their needs? And then start building tools and resources and find the resources to say, oh, cool, the community needs a fund, for example, for creators. And then we, we experimented that with JMB Whiskey by building an incubator called JMB Hive, where we funded our creatives through a brand, which is a, a really not necessarily the most, I can I say, visible thing on the continent. Brands don't like putting money into the hands of creative directly on the continent. They'd rather be by an agency, via someone else. But we, managed to, we actually invested like in some really good ideas that, that are still alive today, right? So one of the biggest ideas that we invested was called Batu, a sneaker brand. Batu is like in South Africa right now, it's got about 30 something stores, right? When we met him, he went and put a thousand, uh, a thousand sneakers and we invested in him. So that shows you the power of community that once you have community, you can build resources and infrastructure around creative people. And infrastructure is spaces, physical and online. Infrastructure is funding. Infrastructure is knowledge. Infrastructure is community. All those things are important for a creative person to thrive and for the creative economy to kind of establish itself, basically. So first of all, just going back to, you, you mentioned your immigrant upbringing and 
being a foreigner in, in South Africa. What are some of the things that you've experienced um, and, and learned from uh, having that that experience of being an immigrant multiple times? What are some of the things that you've learned? Being an immigrant, I guess the challenges, of course, is that the resources that are available here, you, you don't necessarily have them also, <laughs> easy access to them. Like I struggle with things like, for example, because I'm a refugee in South Africa, travel is hard. Um, for me to travel, it's, it's a bit of a process. So I miss out on opportunities. Also, creative is big on the continent. And there's been many invitations around the world to come and speak about all of these different things. I can't go most of the time. So it's, it's a process. I always have to send someone else on my behalf. That's number one. Access to funding, access to finance is a big one. Personally, access to credit. I can't even get a car on, on what call, even, if, even if I have a job. My job, I never have a full-time contract. It's always very consulting agreement. So that's the challenges. But I've had to, I've had to learn to make, make work with it and figure it out. And I think that's important. Figure also being an immigrant, you kind of have no choice but to make things work. <laughs> so that's, I think that's the thing is that you, you, you also being an immigrant, you're very research oriented because now you're looking for opportunities, you're looking for things that fit you to what you need. And so you're making things the little you have and trying to expand it and monetize quickly uh, and, and as cleanly as possible. So some things I've learned also is being a migrant, you kind of start now having to build communities with other migrants, but then also with locals also because now you're trying to create a safe zone <laughs> for you. Uh, so I think that's important. But also, because now I have kids here that are South African, I have no choice but to make South Africa work also <laughs> for them. So I can no longer think myself as, an, as a migrant only. I also think myself as, as a South African because my kids are here. So I kind of have to make things work here. And that's super, super important for me now that where they are, yeah. their immediate environment is has to function. It has to work. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Great. Great. Um, and, and creative nestlings then, you, you started touching on some of the uh, structures that you, you've put in place. What, what are the things that you're currently doing where people can engage with creative nestlings? Yeah. So I think with, with creative nestlings right now, we've had, like as I mentioned, we've had to restructure, right? Uh, and that, that restructuring has meant that we had to look at the business processes of creative nestlings. So, okay, looking at okay, cool. How how have we how have we kind of got this far? Okay, cool. It's been through community. It's been through looking at different revenue streams. But then those revenue streams are not, are not necessarily built for sustainability. So, what we've done is okay, cool. Now, let's figure out how do you separate the two. So, because everything everything was kind of kind of starting to come together too much, and it was overwhelming the the infrastructure of creative nestlings, right? So now we, what we've done is that we're going to relaunch as, as the Creative Nestlings Foundation. So all our talks, events, all those different projects now will fall under, 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 under that banner, right? So all that community building will fall under that. So that will fall under the foundation. And then what we're going to do is that, and then we're going to launch a platform, a separate platform, which is going to be the, the business side of Creative Nestlings, separate registration, separate everything, right? And then that business is going to have as a platform for building communities and all that kind of stuff, right? So that's what we're doing. And then the foundation allows us to be able to raise money a bit easier operationally. So, that, so, 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 so that, that allows us to be able to, or what do you call it, monetize a bit better, right? And sustain, sustain a bit of team and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, so that's, what, that's what, how we're restructuring, yeah, mm -hmm. in terms of creative nesting. So, so everything still remains the same, but then now it's about how do we operationalize, how do we build a team better, all that kind of stuff. And so the platform will be a separate entity because we'll realize we try to build the entity on the platform on top. So that you can't build a, can't build a startup on top of a feel good uh, function in structure. You can't do that. You can't have to separate the two. So you, this, the startup does its work, and then the feel good stuff does its work, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Great. And so, what's the process that's led you? You've mentioned that you, you've kind of taken a step back over the last few years to. Uh, rediscover your creativity and, and take a different perspective on creative nestlings. So what's, yeah. what's that process been over the last few years? And what was the, maybe you want to touch on the reasoning as well, uh, yeah. how you got to that point. Yeah, I mean, in 20, 20, I think 2017, 2018, I got, I got really tired of, how can I say, just everything was working out for everybody else, right? And, but then I was not the one that was fine. Everyone else around me was okay financially. They were doing well. The, the resources we were providing were doing well for everybody. You know what I mean? And then I realized, wait, 
I should have forgotten about myself. You know, if something happens to me today, my kids are going to suffer. All right. And, but then also, I, I have not found joy anymore. It was great being put together, being all the things, but what do I want to do? So what ended up happening? Like, cool. I turned something to I said, like, okay, I'm done. Uh, we were doing a, a project for, 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 for Mini. Uh, they made a documentary. It was a research project. I said, that project, like, I'm done. I don't want to do anything else, more creative since I think creative should just die. <laughs> that was my thinking at the time, right? Because I'd done everything I wanted to do in creative yeah. The 10-year plan we had, we'd done everything I wanted to do. It was great, but then at the same time, it's like, okay, cool. But what does Dylan want to do? What does Dylan enjoy? Because everyone keeps talking about their passions and everything. Like, I want to make films, right? So through me and I managed to do a film, a documentary, which is available on our website. Um, and then I took a break from creative nestlings. It's, it still ran on the community side of things, social media platforms and everything, the WhatsApp group. They still ran because that's easy to kind of maintain it. It's, like it's, it's zero cost, basically, right? Uh, and then I was like, cool, let me, let me focus on myself. And then Corona hit. <laughs> um, and then Corona hit. And then in 2020, I, I was just figured, trying to figure out, what do I want to do? I started writing films. I started writing all that kind of stuff. But then it was like, cool, what, what do I want to do with Dylan personally? I was like, I, let me look at my career. What do I have to myself? Like me as Dylan SP, besides founding Creative Nestlings. Where is that? If you go into my LinkedIn, is it going to say just Creative Nestlings and that's it? <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> you know what I mean? For me, personally, right? I was like, okay, let me, let me, let me reconfigure my life. And then last year, I ended up going to uh, Curating Falcons. I looked for a job. I curated, I got a job at Curating Falcons Festival at Timor Hong. The festival went well. But I was like, oh, it's not necessarily for me. That's still creative industry too much. Uh, so I went back again to say, cool, let me write some films. And then I got offered a job at Vanza. I took a job as a manager director at Vanza, but I didn't like the, the structure there. So, so let me leave that. So it's not necessarily fulfilling. Um, and then this year, uh, Vanza was this year also. And then doing the, no, I got offered another job at, uh, I'm in where I am now doing entrepreneur residence, which is helping entrepreneurs. It's slightly a bit different from the usual creative nestling stuff because it's very tech startup world, right? Which is still part of the creative industry, but it's very technology, very businessy less feel good, it's more about impact, it's about, it's about business, it's about making money and making things that work quickly now and all that kind of stuff. So helping the entrepreneurs build their businesses. This is, so this has been interesting two or three years of repurposing myself as an individual, right? So I can be able to stand next to the people that I've been building for, but now I'm able to now also gain something as part of that process and, and, and be able to stand with them and say, oh, cool, I also have a career. It's not just creative mm-hmm. things. Even with films now, I've been writing films over the last two, three years. And now I'm starting to make those films in the press. I'm, I'm currently working on, I'm trying to make a short film over the next two months, a short film, my, my first debut short film, basically. I'm doing all of that stuff as part of the process. So I can also have that self-fulfillment. It's great when someone else wins. You're like, oh, great, amazing. Oh, cool, what, whatever we're doing works. But it's not it's like the same when it's you winning, right? When it's, when it's you having that sense of achievement, sense of like, oh, cool, I've done something and I finished it on my own. Always being the advisor, the, 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 the ecosystem builder is great, but it's not the most fulfilling journey, especially after so long. It's draining emotionally, it's draining financially, it's draining physically, because I've taken so many risks building for everybody else over the last you know, 10 years, 10, 12 years. And, and the fruits of those, I don't think I will experience, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> I hope my kids do, but I know everyone else is experiencing that. But hopefully the next generation will experience it somehow. Someone else is doing it, but I don't think I'll get those values. But I need to kind of to cover myself and my basis. It's important for me to kind of have that uh, opportunity, basically. So that's where I'm at now, where I'm trying to balance out the, the creative nestlings and the Dillion, you know, individual, like individual and the company that I've started. But even the company itself, the foundation, I will no longer control. Uh, it'll control. We're going to put out a job posting this month uh, for an managing director. So I won't control that anymore. The startup I'll control initially because I'm trying to build that to be a credible startup, right? To really make it amazing and really make a good startup and then find someone else to run it also because I don't necessarily see myself in that space anymore as much. I'm just building the foundation. The foundation has been laid now. Now someone else must come and take over. So I, also, I can I can make the things I want to make. I want to make movies. I want to get rich and make movies. That's about it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. It's only I, I feel you with what you're saying. I'm sure a lot of people can resonate. The people who um, are creatives and go into building platforms, go into working with with broader communities. It's always important to 
come back and assess so you don't forget your value as a creative. And so maybe even you don't question yourself or other people don't question you as a creative. Um, yeah. I, I have that feeling as well as running Nairobi Design Week, but some people don't realize I'm a designer. Um, so it's that's also, uh, you know, as a designer, I went into running a design festival, uh, not as a festival director. So those are skills yeah. you have to up so what are what are some of the skills or things things as you're doing let's say you're starting again if you were to start again for um what what are some of the things that you'd recommend for people to to watch out for especially being a creative going into going into business trying to run something bigger than just a solo thing yeah i don't know i, I guess notes from my journey uh, I always say to people like the phrase everything that could go wrong did go wrong that's how you summarize creative nestling this in the last 10 whatever 11 years of inception basically right everything that was supposed to go wrong did go, went bankrupt lost things I got divorced in the process I was not necessarily the best present dad was you know, you know depressed at some point was homeless at some point uh, won some awards, won some good big contracts, lost some big contracts, do the travel, people won, people got rich out of it. All the things happened. So the good and the bad did come about. So I think I, I always say, like my, my thing is, what are you willing to lose? What, 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 what is possible? What, what, what could you possibly lose as far as the process? Make a list of that. <laughs> and, and you'll see it's going to, you know, once you're more away, it will hit you less hard. Right. So now I know, okay, cool. Here's what it takes for me. To, here's my personal sustainability, what that takes. Right. Here's what's important to me now. Uh, I think if I'd known a bit earlier, maybe I'd have made some, some different decisions, but I don't regret anything because mm -hmm. I think uh, all those experiences kind of shape who I am now. Right. And, and they shape everybody around me. And that's kind of gotten to that point where people are finding value in that experience. Uh, and, and, and they're taking that as notes, not necessarily advice. I don't, I don't, I don't believe in advice. I believe in notes from someone else's journey, right? Uh, yeah, and, and I think, yeah, the, the, some of um, oh, one thing I suck at is money. So I think one thing, I, one skill I wish I had early on, which I still don't have now, is better money management. <laughs> I, I think I wish I had, I had taken that course at school when they offered it. You know, when I was in university, because I've been take degrees, so I thought, why would I need to take? Why would I need finance in the take degree? But I realized actually, no, you do need finance in, in your life as as a whole, basically. And I think that's super, super important. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, you know, I, I guess those are some of the things. Yeah, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, financial management. As a creative, I also didn't take economics or business studies at school. I mean, uh, when it was offered, I took other subjects like history and design, um, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, which is, yeah. But so uh, any creatives out there listening, if you can take the opportunity to get educated a bit on finances, if you can work with an accountant, then even better. Yeah. Yeah, I would say make yeah. accountant friends, make lawyer friends, keep them around. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Accountant and lawyer, uh, those two are yeah. very important for a company. Yes, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are what are then some of those those difficult areas that where you felt it's I don't feel this is coming back and then what's brought you to what's made you bring it back? What's, what's made you make a comeback and the, giving you the perseverance? Yeah. Oof. I think I realized, you know, the, the more you, the creative industry is, is one of the like biggest, like, you know, um, it's, it's, it's got an easy barrier to entry, right, for young creatives, right? Um, and, and I think seeing young creatives struggle with the same struggle that I faced and my peers faced kind of saddens me, right? Because some of the things can be mitigated by building community and sharing knowledge and sharing insights and sharing resources, right? So I think that's what makes me keep coming back to it. And then also seeing people succeed, seeing people win based on the note you gave them or based on the connection you gave them. I think that, that kind of keeps you persevering, but they're also willing to experiment. I remember when, when we were trying to make a book uh, for creative nestlings, people were like, oh, why would you want to make a book? No one's going to buy those books. No one's going to care about the book. 
where everyone's digital right now. No one reads anymore. Uh, I was like, okay, we'll see, you know. And then we, we, we made our books. Our books always sell out whenever we print them, you know. And then also our books. And then people are like, oh, I don't, I don't know any 60 creatives on the continent. I'm like, oh, just buy our book. It's got 60 creatives in it. Now you can never complain and say you don't know, you know. <laughs> so, so, so those little small interventions in, in between are, are super, super important for me. Yeah. Tell me more about that book then and what was the key to, to it being success in, what, in, in your perceived um, you know, success? What, what made it successful and how do you make a print product these days uh, successful? Yeah. And what, what was the book? Yeah. You said six so, so creatives, the book, yeah? Yeah, it's good, it's good. What it takes... Uh, so it's a book series that we developed. That the idea was, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big Monocle uh, fan, and they make some of the most amazing books, right? And and an and amazing magazine, but they never focus on Africa, which sucks. Sucks, but eh, what can you do? Um, you know, that's the market and all that kind of stuff. But then I, I realized through Monocle that books are still important. They, they're still an archive that is super, super important. So the idea was, okay, cool. What if we went around? So all the creators that are spoken in our talks. How do you repurpose them and bring them back to the fold? And also, but then create a permanent um, catalog of who they, here's, who, here's, who, who, here's who came through Creative Nestling's uh, talk series, for example, or community. So let's just interview them one question. So what is their advice on entrepreneurship as a creative? Advice on you know, community and failure, all that kind of stuff. That's the idea of the book, 60 Creatives, One Question. Uh, and then it's literally one, one photograph <laughs> and then a quote, and that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. And it's a simple book. And what makes print successful now is that always build community first, right? So always, always, always build community first. And then you sell, sell, they then sell to that community book as a byproduct, right? But then also that commu- the community can feature in the books. So now they're most likely to buy them because their peers, they're in them. Their peers are in them. Uh, and, and then other people now that are looking to access that, that community, access through that book. Right, so that's a, that's a good revenue generation. I think community is always important for book publishing right now. And then also one thing, um, I'm good at researching, so I, I did a lot of research around paper and I iterated. So there's been two versions of the book. It's been a soft cover book, right, which is version one. And then now there's a hard cover book available, which is gonna we're gonna reprint by end, for the end of the year because we wanna reissue it because people want the book, right, before we do volume two. So, so also knowing where the printers are, negotiating, tech, talking to them. They, actually, funny enough, Africa is still good at printing. We just don't have a lot of print shops. So it's about knowing where they are and negotiating with them. And I've noticed actually there, there are areas and regions where there's still specialties that are not dead. So print is still alive in Durban, for example, for printing, because they print for big industries. But they're still okay printing for us, even in small quantities. Actually, it might end up being cheaper than soft. It's actually cheaper than soft cover, print hard cover. Right, that, that's all done through research and iteration. And so I'm, I'm a tech person, so I iterate, I iterate. There's always versioning, versioning, versioning. And I, I apply that across the creative process. So I think that's what makes it a, a, a good book. And also avoid distributors as much as possible and book shops because they tend to take a big cut. So if you're looking to, 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 to price your book the way you want and do it the way you want, it's easier when you self distribute because now you have your community. Uh, but then when you, when you go to the bookshops and everything, <laughs> You're gonna lose some money in the process. You get bigger, rich, yes, but then the returns might not necessarily be the same. So it also depends why you're doing the book for. Yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. Well, congrats. It's, uh, and where can people find it to pre order it and find out more about the book and Creative Nestlings? So the book is going to is be the book reprinted. Part of Creative Nestlings? Yes, it's, it's part of Creative Nestlings. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be on our website uh, once we have the the, print, the copies available, hoping for October. Um, and then we're going to do another version of, of Volume 2 uh, next year, early next year. But the, the old book, which came out in 2018, is going to be reissued again uh, now in October on our website, yeah, mm-hmm. which I don't know why it's down right now. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, what what's the website? Or oh, you'll you'll send? Yeah, you can s- tell us the website, and then uh, yeah. we'll add it onto yeah. the description for the podcast. Okay, so it's creativenestlings dot com. So creativenestlings dot com. Yeah. Nice. And creative nestlings on Instagram and Twitter as well. Yes. Yes. And TikTok now. <laughs> 
We're nice. trying the young men's game. <laughs> hey, nice. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Great. Have you have you got other other stories, anything else that you'd really like to share with uh, you know as part of this episode? Hmm. I don't know. Huh? <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess I, I guess the questions that yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and from your side, what is it? What, what is it like to be creative in, in Nairobi right now? Yeah, it's exciting. I think there's a lot of yeah. um, a lot of people coming through. You know, um, we've got a new generation of creative talent coming through now. Some of the people who were students during the first Nairobi Design Week in 2015 are now creative directors and, and marketing managers and, and so on. They're leading agencies and working at IDEO as senior designers, IDEO.org, and, and so on. So um, it's now the next generation is also taking things into their own hands. You know, people are yeah. being independent. There are a lot of trying to run creative businesses and doing that the new way in terms of you know offering fashion shoots to people for their instagram feed um that sort of stuff uh, a lot of people doing digital art i've heard artists here really tell me that um with digital having a computer or having a, a phone i've seen people do animations or just beautiful sketches on phones you know and start yeah. there and then build up uh, by yeah. printing postcards that drawn on their phone, so the digital part is really enabling people to show to show their work across the world and to create things that put them on an equal footing because anyone can download Blender. Um, yeah. And then on the physical side, there's people discovering uh, a lot of indigenous knowledge. We're, we're really excited by by indigenous materials and ways of working, um, and so yeah, I think I think that's it. I think there's a challenge with access to foreign markets and with the market in Nairobi not being as big as South Africa or Lagos or, or so on. Um, so th I, yeah. I guess that's yeah, that's a part of the challenge that a lot of the people are trying to solve as well. Yeah. But definitely, I mean, yeah, I guess it's across, it's the same across the board, you know, across the entire continent. That the creators, that the younger generation, is really doing amazing work. But then, access to market is still a big challenge. But they are in better than we. When our generation, when we started out, you know, now now kids can make money quickly on uh, of just posting, you know, content on TikTok and Instagram, and, and and you know, grow followers quickly and generate revenue and monetize and all that kind of stuff. But then I'm noticing that access to market is still like you know once you kind of get here, there's a ceiling, you know. The, the, the next big part is, is is a challenge. You know what I mean? So I think and I mean, it's exciting. I believe it's exciting now because I think the things that were difficult for us are a bit easier for them. Um, so it makes for 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 better ecosystem. And I think it's our gen our generation's responsibility now to start investing back into the thing into the creative industry, right? Uh, and building infrastructure. I, I'm not debating someone. I was talking to someone the other day about how in, in Johannesburg, Brownfontein is known as the, the creative center. But I'm like, okay, cool. what's our generation doing to make sure that we own the, 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 the land and buildings in that space so the, the, the generation is coming up? When they're looking at Brownfontein, they can say, oh, okay, cool, that's how far you can take it, right? So I, I think that's, a, that's, the, that's like the, the potential across that as, as, as the creators that I, that I found some sort of success, it's our job to reinvest back into the things that we're successful at. Uh, into the infrastructure and and and, and building funds. I, I, mean, I was talking to my team earlier on around. I want to build a one a one, a one million dollar fund for creatives next year, right? And just go crazy, just funding across creatives, right? I'm not necessarily looking for immediate ROI. I'm just looking for one potential unicorn. But in the process, how many experiments can happen, right? And I, I think that's important. That's kind of mindset when you start thinking about is the generation that has kind of been here for a very long time in the creative industry. Right, and, and I think across the board, you are seeing the same thing, the same challenges. Space is an issue, funding is an issue, infrastructure is an issue, knowledge, knowledge is, to, to today, knowledge is still an issue, which is so sad to me, is that with all these platforms like Masterclass, Skillshare, it's hard to find a good platform for African creatives teaching you 
about being a photographer in the immediate region, which is something we're working on creatives on our platform is, is to have an e-learning, you know, component of our, of our, of our tech platform is because we are like, for example, you are an industrial designer and you've been in the game for a very long time. Imagine you teaching class, but then teaching class in a localized environment, right? In, in your immediate environment. And, and then like, creatives in, 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 mm-hmm. in Kenya can know a lot more about being industry in, industrial designer in their immediate environment. Yes, with a global appeal, of course, but then at least the context is a bit different. It's nuanced to, 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 to your locality and on the continent and then the world. Not the thing where we're all inheriting from Europe or the guy tells you, oh, I started off, you know, on Amazon or I started off on this, on that. But we don't have access to the same platform and, and distribution points. We don't have access to the same information and knowledge and infrastructure. So localization is super, super important, which is something that we're trying to cover through knowledge via creative business platform and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's it's something that we touch on a lot because, um, you know, I've worked with products that have been, I've, I've come across products in a Kenyan supermarket that I was working on in the UK five years yeah. before, you know. Um, so it, it's understanding what we have locally that we can utilize, that we can learn from both in skill sets and, and materials and resources. And yeah. then... Sometimes it scales beyond just the local level and, and it yes. can be useful. Maybe it's some uh, a type of plant or something, right? And then um, sometimes maybe it just stays local as a useful local solution for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That's something I came across um, work, working in water and sanitation as a human centered designer. That's how I yeah. came to Kenya. Um, yeah. So we we realized that we couldn't replicate, you can't copy and paste a solution from from Mark. central Kenya to western Kenya or from Kenya to Ghana or the other way around. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, because I think those lessons are not so well documented. You know, we, we see a lot of lessons from around the world. And I think it's time to start really making that knowledge available and easily accessible, right, for, for, for everybody else around us, right? So, so yeah. we're building better. You know, we need to start building better for, for a better quality of life on the continent. Because right now, it's like we're, we're trying to import a better quality of life. <laughs> and that's very, very mm-hmm. dangerous. I, I think we're seeing that across all industries around the world. And I think the creative industry is a good place to be because then we can experiment and iterate and, and, and really use insights and then human centered design, like, like I mentioned, to really develop the next generation of solutions and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. That's a. Perfect, perfect uh, tie-up, I think. So yeah. thanks so much. Um, where no, can people you so find you? Where, how, how should people interact with you? Where, they, where can they find you online and how can they uh, yeah. support and, and work with you? So I guess for Creative Nestlings, it's Creative Nestlings across all channels. It's just, it's just Creative Nestlings. Um, uh, and then for me, it's Dylan S. Period across all channels. And then for I'm In, it's I'm In uh accelerator across all channels yeah but if they go to to any of my like my, my my personal instagram they can find everything i'm working on all that kind of stuff and, and twitter uh but yeah they can connect share ideas they can join out we, we have a whatsapp group for creatives across africa if they want to join it uh I'll, the link i'll share the link with you uh they can join that link and stuff it's full of like, creatives across the entire continent basically uh, that are doing amazing stuff. And it's, it's more of a channel where we just share opportunities that are in the creative industries, basically. Yeah. Perfect. We'll add that to the episode description so people can join the group. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah? Thank you so much. I um, hope we can do this again. I hope, uh, I'm, uh, are you in Cape Town? Joburg. Joburg. You're in yeah, Joburg, Johannesburg. Joburg. Uh, yeah. I'm going to be in Cape Town in um, in less in a month. Actually, in three weeks, I'm going to be in Cape Town for the oh, okay. DCon. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. yeah, I'm in Cape Town. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm in Cape Town one week a month. So probably I'm chill anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Eleventh to the twenty-first, I'll be in Cape Town, and then oh, back okay. to Nairobi. So. Yeah, I'll let you know because we, we, we might do some talks uh, in Cape nice. Town next month. But I'll let you know. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. And enjoy the rest of your day. And I'll catch you you soon. All right. (laughs) Cheers. Cheers. If you've made it this far, have ideas for episodes or know somebody we should feature, please let us know. 
Full episode transcripts are available at our website, africa.design. All the links are in the description. We're available on all your favorite podcast platforms. I'm Adrian Yankoviak. This episode was edited by David King-Ori. And thank you for tuning in to Africa Design. <laughs>